All right, welcome into the Aftershock. Jamin Moore here with Alex Morgan. It's a duo tonight. The Quakes lose 3 0 in St. Louis. Alex, I'm still trying to think of a positive we can take from this game. Um, it felt like everything went wrong. And, and when you get into cold weather like this, sometimes you just want to make sure you leave healthy. And that didn't happen either. Uh, you know, what did you see tonight? First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here with us tonight and for uh, bearing through that game because that was frustrating in every aspect I can possibly imagine. At every point uh, for the earthquakes, it felt like the ball was falling the wrong way. Their guys were going down. The referee was making the wrong call. Uh, it was a brutal game. And, and I think some of that you could expect going into uh, St. Louis – you know, that's only their second ever home match. So you're going to expect a pretty raucous atmosphere. Uh, you know, the cold weather was predictable. We know that they're a tough team to play against. There's a reason that they're 3-0 and in their first three games of the year. It's because they're a really high-intensity team, and they're going to force those turnovers and make it difficult for you. All that stuff you could expect. What you couldn't anticipate was Carlos Grezzo going down midway through the first half. Uh, and getting injured. And, and after that point, ever really felt like the Quakes had a chance in this game. They were doing their best just to hold on in those first 25 minutes. Uh, once he went down, they had no way of, of withstanding that intense pressure that St. Louis were, were putting on them. And everything kind of fell apart uh, after that moment. That felt like the key moment when the, the momentum shifted and there was no going back. Yeah, when, when a, any player goes down like that, you know, without – without real contact that, that I noticed. I mean, he just sat down on the field twice. I'm not quite sure what precipitated it, but uh, you know, when your defensive midfielder, you know, goes down without contact, you know, that's, that's problems and no Judson uh, and no Montero. And so you're getting lighter and lighter in central midfield. Literally you're only, you know, regular, you know, starting level midfielder at that point is Jackson Yule. Um, no knock it to Michael Baldissimo. He, he has had starts, you know, for Vancouver. He's not a six. He's certainly not going to boss Kraus around. I can tell you that, uh, you know, he looked a little bit overrun by some of the size. Those are some big European, you know, boys out there that, uh, that we saw in St. Louis tonight, you know, Kraus with the goal. He looked like a man among boys at times, even and the Quakes have a decent size back line these days compared to, to what they've had in the past. And he still looked big compared to, to, to the Quakes back line. Yeah, Klaus was incredible. I expect him to be in the Klaus, not Klaus. For, yes. uh, for, yeah. for MLS MVP this season on the basis of yeah. that performance. Uh, not only is he an absolute bulldozer, but he has composure and clinicality in the final third. Uh, and their collective press is really, really hard to play out of. And the Quakes were doing it a little bit in the first 15 minutes, uh, but it just felt like they got tired. By the end of the first half, uh, they were you know, already wiped. You could tell that front line. And those are three athletic players with you know, Cade Cowell, Christian Espinosa, and Jeremy Abobasi. They were wiped at the end of that first half. Uh, and, and, and yeah, that, St. Louis were, were really strong tonight. But from the Quakes' perspective, I, I think it shows a problem with the roster building in the midfield. Because any team is going to struggle – you know, when they lose two of their starting midfielders, it's going to be hard for any MLS team uh, to, to cope if you have, you know, Jameer Montero suspended and Tommy Thompson out. And, and I'll continue this thought. And I, we're going to speak to Lucci now. Uh, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Let's start with questions. Um, so let's get the first one from Alex Morgan. Go ahead, Alex. Hi, Lucci. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for speaking with us tonight. Uh, it's good to talk to you. Uh, what are your takeaways uh, from this game? It feels like a really frustrating one in all aspects. You know, once you have Carlos Guerrero go down in the midfield like that, you lose two of your key three pieces. It feels like from there it's an uphill battle. Uh, and that was kind of a momentum shifting moment. Yeah, look, that's unfortunate um, for for him and for the team. He's he's really important to us and what he does in terms of ball recovery and, and intensity 
and leading us in, in energy and um and so yeah so we, we're analyzing that hopefully it's not nothing too serious he's supposed to go with the national team so we're going to have to see uh, how this works uh, moving forward but yeah you know I, I that's not ideal you know when you play a team like st louis to their credit they're full throttle they're very aggressive i thought we matched that very early in fact i thought we created uh, some of the, the better chances early in the game and we started well um you know we lost some momentum probably maybe when carlos left the game but we have to show we're a team. Uh, this is a collective game, and we—it's important we show our depth. Um, and 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 uh, you know, it didn't—it didn't go our way, and we weren't able to maintain our intensity and and uh, and and get the objective done for the game. Um, you know, but we got to learn from that, and we, we want to compete better than than tonight. You know, we had good moments to compete. I thought even in the second. Second half uh, could have made it 2-1, and early in the second half, that, that can change the game. But uh, we weren't fortunate to, to put those away, and 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 then they, you know, they increased their energy. Uh, they got their third, so put the game away. So, what, you know, again, we're we're disappointed. Uh, we know we can do better, um, and and we're going to learn from it. We'll have some guys missing next week against Toronto, but we got to show again what what kind of squad and depth mentality we have to respond uh, at home against Toronto now. Next up, Damon Moore. Unmuted. Hi, Lucy. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Um, obviously, it, it was a tough night tonight. You did make some shifts at, at halftime, uh, maybe even shift a formation there. Can you just talk us through kind of, you know, what you saw in the first half that made you uh, decide to uh, have two subs at halftime? Thanks. Muted. Yeah, look, we, first of all, we, 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 um, we got to learn – in terms of uh, managing the the end of the first half, conceding this two zero right before halftime is it, it's t that's tough, you know. Because had we gone into the half one zero, I think uh, we can be a little more methodical in terms of the next moment and, and get back into the game and tie the game. Um, but you know, two zero down, you, you have to then at that point decide, you know, are you going to go for this aggressively or you kind of see how the game goes in the second half and then make changes. We decided it. To, to make adjustments to to show an immediate response. And I actually thought we did well to create a few good chances uh, with, with those adjustments. So we wanted a few guys that were, were vertical and attacking minded on the field and shifted a formation to kind of load the back, the opposition's back line and give them more trouble. Um, and like, and I thought, you know, the game wasn't as controlled because we lost a number in the midfield, but at the end of the day, I thought, I thought we posed some good danger and, um, and, and maybe could have changed the game around, but it didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Hey, Lucci. Uh, next question, Bobby Renkel. Hey, Lucci. Thank you for talking to us today. I want to talk a little bit about the locker room after that loss. What player was a vocal leader telling the younger guys, you know, it's a long season ahead. Keep your head up. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, honestly, they they were very disappointed because, you know, they don't want to lose to that scoreline. I think our game is – the game can be a little deceiving where, you know, we did create some good chances. We had some volume of crosses. Uh, but, unfortunately, we didn't put enough shots on frame, and they did, and it made the difference even with the deflection at the end. So, um, you know, it, you could see the the disappointment in their face. You have guys like <clears throat> like J, JT and, and J Jonathan Mensa who you could see already uh, just, just trying to show a spirit of, Hey, let's. We got to keep working. We got to keep improving. Let's learn from this. So those are those are a few examples. But look, the group in, in its entirety is has a great mentality. Uh, they they want to keep learning. They want to keep improving and getting better every day. Um, and tonight is going to be a, a reference for us to, you know, when you play these the physical team, the team that's really uh, going to duel, make every every ball count, every moment count. Um, I thought we had moments of it, but we weren't consistent enough in how we competed in those duels and those in those battles. And, and I and I know we can do better. Thank you. Let's take a couple more questions. Uh, let's now go back to Alex Morgan for a second. Hey, Luigi. Thanks for taking another question. I'm I'm curious where you're at mentally. You know, in this moment, um, maybe what this loss tells you about where the team's at and some of the challenges that you might have to face going forward this season. Um, does it, you know, change the way you see any of those things about the team or, or what you're bracing for maybe with some of the, the, uh, the issues with injuries or depth that you guys might face? Look, yeah, we, we've had some challenges with, with, 
injuries in depth in the last few weeks, you know, losing Nico and Jutson in the midfield uh, a few weeks ago, uh, that doesn't help. Hopefully that they can be back soon. Um, losing Nathan in preseason as center back, uh, you know, it did give us the opportunity to bring in a player like Jonathan Mensah, who's been really positive for the group on and off the field. Um, losing Daniel the other day uh, to, to a meniscus injury, you know, he'll be back in about four to six weeks. And then, um, and then tonight, you know, Gressel going down, Rod, 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 Rodriguez going down, we lose some physicality, some bite, some speed, some power. So, look, th these are things that are part of the, the game. Every team's going to have these challenges. And, of course, I want all our, our players healthy so we can be full force. But we have to show, uh, even when we're missing guys, that we, we have a way of playing. We have a team mentality. We have depth. Um, and we have pride in how we want to compete. So that's the opportunity we have now to respond and show that depth and show that identity. And when it doesn't go our way, how, how do we uh, make it better? And even with challenges and adversity and injuries and, and doing it home next week is our opportunity to show that. So my mentality, calm. Let's keep focusing on the process. Let's rest, let's recover, let's look at some video, and let's start training and, and responding and training. Take a second one from Jamin Moore. Unmuted. Hey, Lucci, thanks for taking a second. Um, I noticed tonight that, uh, at least on television, it looked like uh, they did a good job really containing Christian Espinoza. He's someone who's been extremely dangerous for you this season in the attack. When you see that a team, you know, is, is able to bottle up, you know, a player like that, uh, you know, where are you looking for that attack to come from, you know, when, when you can see that they're going to try to take that away from you? Did you have a did you have like a second place that you wanted to see more attack come from that that didn't quite make it tonight, but but you want to see more from that uh, from a different area? Muted. Yeah, look again. I thought Christian started the game pretty well, um, and as well as others, as well as Cade uh, with some isolations and quick attacks in behind. So, um, but as the game went on, yeah, you know they 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 started to win battles that that led to plays that you know we we could. We didn't defend well enough to to not concede. So Christian uh, is to his credit is, is going to be always be a scouted player, a marked player and double team, triple team player because of his ability to get in behind, to cross, to get in the box. And so, you know, that's that's to his credit. And we have to we have to know that. And he's, we got to find solutions for him to continue to be effective with that. And um, and, and then others, uh, you know, showing uh danger showing movements to to combine with Christian to play off of Christian to get in the box to receive his crosses and and if you know if he for whatever reason wouldn't be available to even compete and show depth in that position so you know we we've got young players you know again at halftime we put some guys on the field that I thought were more effective in getting in behind and giving issues to their last line um, but ultimately we, we didn't we didn't score we have to be disappointed that we didn't score tonight and, we got to keep working to figure that out. Thanks, Luchi. Uh, we'll be bringing out a player here in a bit. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Okay, so we'll be uh, bringing in uh, Alex here again as soon as he rejoins from the Paris conference. I know he's going to have some thoughts. And uh, here's Alex. Okay, so first off, let me just quickly say. I got the Aftershock scarf over here and out more visible tonight. It was behind me last week, and I, I think people couldn't really see it. So I did that in memory of Michael Peachy, our beloved, uh, our, our beloved patron, who was there tonight in the cold with his Aftershock scarf in whatever it was, 20 degree weather, you know, freezing cold temperatures, but out there showing off his Aftershock scarf. I hope he makes it back. Uh, I'm a little bit worried. He was he was definitely joining the the uh, game chat uh, on Slack during the game and mistyping a lot because we think he was typing with mittens uh, or something because it was so cold there tonight. So I just want to point out uh, that I put that out just for you uh, tonight, Michael. Thanks for representing the aftershock, you know, in the in the stadium in, in St. Louis. So Alex, what did we get from that press conference? The, the resilience and fighting mentality of Quake's Ever Center patrons That's uh, right. never ceases to uh, amaze me. Uh, sometimes uh, their sanity is uh, questionable to, to withstand that, uh, uh, that kind of weather in St. Louis. But uh, 
we we are thankful to Michael for all his support. Hey everyone, for, we're uh, going to be having repping, Defender Tommy Thompson uh, join us here in a few center. minutes. Uh, and again, Tommy Thompson will be. I just heard here in a that we're going to be speaking Thank to you. Tommy Thompson in a few minutes, which is a surprising uh, player for the Earthquakes to send to us, given uh, the 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 match that he had, given that he was hauled off at halftime after a really really rough first half. So I'm a little surprised by that decision, and I feel bad for Tommy because he's a great guy. He's been a you know a, a, a spokesperson for the club and a leader around the, the locker room for a long time. But it's very clear that he is, <laughs> you know, uh, not a starting level MLS midfielder. There is a reason that Matias Almeida moved him from the number 10 position to right back. It's because he no longer had what it took to keep up in that number 10 position. And, and we saw that today. And, and I think, you know, it's a problem if you have to be starting Tommy Thompson there. It shows that you don't have enough depth on this team. It's going to be hard for any team to cope when they're down to their starting midfielders with, with Jameer Montero, Nico Shakiris, and, and Carlos Guerrero. But I still think the Quakes, the, the depth at the lower end of that roster isn't convincing to me. It, it's surprising to me that they've continued to re-sign Tommy Thompson after all these years. And it's surprising to me that they re-signed Judson this year because Judson was made of glass last year. He hasn't looked, you know, fit or healthy, you know, in over a year and a half. And if you have two different players there who are more ready to jump in and, and play at high intensity and play at a high level, the outcome tonight could have been different. Am I being too harsh, Jamin? Um, you know, again, the, this is this is one away game. Uh, you don't have your, you don't really have your best overall player on the field. Uh, as we heard from Lucci, I think one of the key things is that the Quakes are going to be missing players due to international call-ins. Um, Cade Cowell, not going on international duty this time around. I think there's some intention there uh, that, that he's not. But, uh, you know, they're, the Quakes are going to have to learn to play because you got Nations League, you got Open Cup. Got a lot of competitions this year. The Quakes are going to need to figure out how to play uh, without. All right, thank you everyone results. for waiting. So, we're now joined by Tommy Thompson. So let's go take a first question from um, Alex Morgan. Hi, Tommy. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, hope you can still feel all your limbs uh, after the the cold out there. Um, how did it feel? You know, that's your first start in midfield in, you know, a, a few years, it, it feels like, um, how did it feel for you and how much did it change when Carlos, you know, goes down after 20 or so minutes there? How did, how did that change what was going on in the midfield? Yeah, I, I felt good. I've been uh, playing there a lot in practice during preseason. So it's allowed me to get comfortable with this system. I like this system a lot and I, I could get plugged in and couple different spots in the field um, and so I'm just happy to contribute to this team and in any way that I can um, but yeah any any first half injury uh, is going to play a role it's it's disappointing to to see that happen uh, I haven't heard exactly what happened or um, what the status is right now um, but it, it was disappointing I hope he's all right uh, but at the end of the day we got guys ready on the bench to come um, in and um, we're going to need our depth for these next two games, especially with guys leaving for national team duty as well. Thank you, Tommy. Next question, Fabio. Hey, it's of the game today. How did that play a factor in the team and as well as the weather? Thank you. Yeah, these are the atmospheres you want to play in front of. Um, we were excited entering the game. I thought we started off strong and uh, we were ready to go. Um, of course, letting up multiple goals before halftime is going is to put you in a difficult spot. Um, but it's a great atmosphere here in St. Louis. Um, and like, like I said, these are, the, these are the nights that you want as a pro soccer player. So uh, I wish it would have gone differently, um, but it was, uh, it was a great atmosphere. Next question, Jamie Moore. Unmuted. Hey, Tommy. Uh, thanks for taking the time tonight. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, there, uh, Lucia said that he had to make some changes at halftime because of the, of the scoreline. And you mentioned, you know, giving up that second goal as well. 
you know, from your perspective, you know, what needed to be different tonight in order to, to get uh, a different, different result? It felt like there were a lot of mistakes in the back that uh, gave St. Louis the ball in dangerous situations. You know, it does, is, was there issues you think in the way that uh, you handled their press? Uh, you know, what, what could have gone differently? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always going to be a challenge um, on the road. Everyone knows that MLS has uh, one of the most difficult dynamics for, for teams that are visiting. Um, so when you go on the road, you got to be sharp and uh, you got to you got to limit uh, all the mistakes that you can. Um, and for us tonight, like I said, I thought we started off well. We were getting in behind, got a couple shots off. Um, but I mean, credit to St. Louis, they they pressed us well. And a couple of times in tra transition, they hurt us. Um, but I, I I think on the road, you, you got to double down. You got to be ready to, uh, to to get behind them and to make sure that, that that they don't get those opportunities that they got they had, especially right before halftime. That's the, those goals hurt um, the most sometimes. So uh, we just got to focus on the game plan. And unfortunately, we didn't execute it um, the way that we wanted to tonight. Okay, so um, let's take a couple more questions, um, and let's uh, take a second one from Alex Morgan. Uh, Alex, do you have one? Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Thanks for taking another question. Uh, I'm curious what the the atmosphere is, what the mentality feels like in the, the locker room right now. It felt like that was a particularly frustrating game, just at every step, somebody going down, the ball going the wrong way. Um, where's the you know feeling at right now? Yeah, it, it was it wasn't our night tonight. Um, that, that that was clear, um, and it's disappointing too to have multiple injuries happen um, in, in, in the game, especially ones that take place in the first half. Uh, so that's that's a disappointment. Um, but at the end of the day, we got to lift our heads up. I thought we've started this season strong. Um, we had a good showing in Atlanta uh, to for the, for the majority of that game, and again, two wins at home is huge. Um, but coming to to St. Louis and the environment that they built here is, is, is always going to be a challenge. Um, so we're disappointed. We're going to reflect on it. Um, but then we're going to come back at home with the same attitude that we brought against uh, Vancouver and the same attitude we brought against against Colorado. Um, these next two home games are, are big, and it's a great opportunity for us to respond and bounce back. Let's take another one from uh, Jimin Moore. Jimin? Unmuted. Hey, Tommy. So, uh, you know, given given that there is going to be, you know, some changes with international duty, but also the, uh, you know, the midfield is feeling thin right now with some injuries. Uh, how much, you know, have you talked with with Lucci about your role in this team? You've, you've, you've played outside back for a number of years, but obviously you've played forward, you've played midfield, you've played all over the pitch. You know, is there clarity for you in terms of what your role is going to be over the next few weeks, given given uh, some of the uh, the things that are going on in the team? Muted. Yeah, over the past couple of weeks, I've spent a lot of time as center mid, so I'm, I'm ready to go uh, if my name gets called. Uh, but for large parts of preseason, I was playing right or left back as well. Uh, so depending on, on what Lucci wants to do, uh, I'm, I'm ready to play anywhere. Uh, but I, I, as of right now, I've been spending most of my time at center mid. But like you said, I'm comfortable at outside back as well. Um, so we just got to take it day by day. We'll regroup. Um, disappointing result tonight, but we'll regroup. We have uh, some time to recover going into the, the the game next week against Toronto, and we'll see where we're at. Um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what's going to happen right now, but over the next couple of days, I'm sure uh, it, it'll become more clear. But like I said, I'm ready to go anywhere. I'm happy to be playing center mid. I'm comfortable there, um, but if need be, I can play elsewhere as well. All right, that concludes tonight's press conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, guys. Okay, so uh, that concludes the uh, the press conference for tonight. Uh, getting uh, Alex back here. There he is. All right, Alex. You know, I know Tommy is is not a player that uh, you know you are particularly excited to see in the starting lineup tonight. Um, but uh, you know, given given what you were able to get from him there, you know, what are your what are your thoughts in terms of the, probably the likelihood we're going to need to see you know, Tommy and Baldissimo getting more time in the central midfield, you know, with international call-ins and injuries. Baldissimo is going to get more time. Um, if, you know, regardless of what happens, you know, if, if Carrezzo is injured, he's not going to be available against Toronto. 
if he's healthy, he's likely going to be with the Ecuador national team. So regardless of, of his status, Baldissimo is likely going to be in that starting lineup next week. Uh, I don't think Tommy Thompson will. I think that Luchi Gonzalez made those changes at halftime because Tommy Thompson isn't strong enough defensively uh, to rely on, right? The first 20 minutes, he made some solid passes and defensively he had enough cover uh, to, to get away with you know, the, some of the lapses that he has and the lack of pace and physicality that he has. But then once Grezzo goes off, he just didn't have the cover. He was, you know, one of the reasons why the Quakes allowed that second goal right on the brink of halftime. It's because he wasn't, you know, able to put in a challenge against Klaus. Uh, he looked, you know, like a kid compared to Klaus. He, he looked like he just bounced right off of him uh, when he was trying to make a challenge there. So I don't think Tommy Thompson is the guy to start uh, in that number 10 role again. I actually liked the the four four two shape in the second half a lot better. Um, even though they're sacrificing that extra number uh, in the middle, I think they're able to get more of their best players on the pitch. And it looked better. If that's the one positive that I have to take away from tonight, it's that I think the halftime substitutions were good. I, I, I think Luchi Gonzalez assessed the situation well and made the right changes. And he was willing to do so. When was the last time we've seen a slate of halftime substitutions in San Jose, Jamin, when, when the Quakes need them? I don't think we've seen that before. And it's not like he has a ton of depth, but he was willing to make some bold calls uh, to haul off players when they weren't playing well. Uh, and, and that set up the Quakes well going into the second half. Look, if Cade Cowell makes either of those two sitters, we could have been talking about a different game. The Quakes would have been in with a fighting chance. Uh, so I, I, I thought those halftime substitutions were good. And I expect that that kind of shape is, is more of what we'll see in these next few weeks. So I'm going to disagree with you on one thing, because I don't think the reason he took Tommy out was for Tommy's performance. I really don't. I think he took Tommy out because he wanted to change the shape. And that was the position to sacrifice. That was the, that was the place you wanted to sacrifice. He's not going to take Yule off the field. Let's be honest about it. He's not going to take Baldissimo off the field. He's, he's basically the only defensive protection you've got back there. And he wanted to change to a 4-4-2. And so someone had to be sacrificed. And it was Tommy, which makes sense. Uh, I, I would not have expected otherwise in that situation. I don't think it was necessarily his performance, although let's be honest, he and Baldissimo didn't cover themselves in glory on that crowd school, but nor, neither did anybody else uh, in that particular situation, especially JT, by the way, who let in another ball, you know, low on the near post. So I'm just going to be a broken record about this. That's his particular problem area. I'm not going to write about it because I'm not going to give that information to competitive teams. But you hit the ball low to the near post to JT. Last time, seven times, you got to beat to the same spot. So, look, you know, that's why they went out and got Daniel. And now you got to be without him for, for four to six weeks. If I'm going to be on a little bit of soapbox on anything right now, there's four Brazilians on this team. They're all hurt right now. So, you know, go figure that one out, too. Yeah, it, I mean, tonight's just rough because there there's a, a lot of, you know, injuries you're dealing with. You're dealing with, you know, a, a poorly played game. You're dealing with uh, a red card situation from Montero that a lot of a lot of fans feel hard done by, um, and and should because I do think that 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 needed a closer look. So you know there's a there's a lot to digest right now. I think you know Lucci did a good job in terms of like you know okay let's take a deep breath right now. What we need to do is we need to get warm. We need to get healthy. You know we need to uh, figure out you know what what we're going to be able to do given the situation that we are dealt. It's not necessarily his fault or anything he can do, do differently with these types of injuries. When you go play in 20 degree weather, you're gonna walk out sometimes with injuries. And that's what happened you know, tonight to add to the misery that you already had on the injury side. It, look though, I, I think Jorge is right here. If you can pull up his comment that with St. Louis's speed in forward press, Tommy Thompson had no business starting this game. It's not. It's, it's not a surprise that St. Louis is so physical and is such a strong press and is going to, you know, so what was he, what was, what was, in oh, the midfield. Hang on, hang on. So before you go throw Tommy off the field, you got to replace him with somebody. Who do you replace him with? I, I think that I, I, I think that realistically he, he just could have started with the 4-4-2 shape. I think he could have been more proactive and, and maybe it's a learning lesson. Maybe, and, and, maybe it's and a learning lesson that, mid, that now he, he knows. He was asked that in midweek and, he's, and he basically said 
I would rather stick with what we are comfortable with and what we know and, you know, what we have been trying to execute so far, which without saying it is that that 433. So I, to I'm change shape like that, that is, also, is also a risk. I'm you go surprised into a that he game like that with a new shape. That's a risk. I'm surprised that he didn't consider other options, though, because last season, something we've seen in the past is Jeremy Obobese drop into a slightly deeper role and be able to play at the top of that midfield diamond. I'm surprised that he didn't consider putting Jeremy he, Obobese in that number 10 position and maybe moving Cade Cowell or Benji Kukanovic in the But he, he talked about why. He, he, he literally explained why on the press conference he didn't do that. So let's rewind a bit, because he specifically said that he went with the 4-4-2 shape, but it gave up some of the control that they wanted to have in the midfield against a 4-4-2. There's a reason the 4-4-2s largely got phased out. It was because of the 4-3-3. Why? Because you overload the central midfield with three players to their two. That's why he went with a 4-3-3. So on paper, it seems like a good move. The problem is you're not advancing the ball past midfield because of the way that they were pressing. I mean, how many times did the Quakes get trapped in the corners in the first half? So you're, you're, uh, you're trying to get an advantage, but St. Louis did a really good job taking that advantage away. And so he decided to go even up in the second half because he needed to be able to try to get uh, a goal and be able to put a little bit more pressure on their back line than he was getting in the first half and go a little bit more long ball and play a little bit more, you know, uh, less through the midfield as they were trying to do in the first half. And he's right. It was fine for the first 15 minutes or so. I don't know if it was 20. It was fine for about the first 15 minutes. And then after that, you know, it didn't really it didn't really work for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which the Quakes were just having a hard time advancing the ball past midfield because they were playing out of the back, which I I know a lot of people are like getting frustrated with playing out of the back. I there's huge advantages to playing out of the back, because if you can play out of that press, you will have the numeric advantage on the opposite side. And they did get that and they mm -hmm. didn't execute. How many times did Kate Gowell like just trip over the ball tonight and didn't execute or took some sort of deep left footed cross for crying out loud? You know, there was a lot of like really poor decision making up top that didn't benefit them, you know, when they did get the numeric advantage and finally uh, get out of the back. Again, and I think it's 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 hard to make any definitive judgments here, Jamin, because we really only saw 20 minutes of it. We really only saw 20 minutes of it before Carlos Gareza went down and then San Jose's entire, you know, game plan had to be be you know uh, flipped on its head because they don't have a guy who can come in and make those tackles like Carlos Guerrero was making in the midfield and so now you have to anticipate the next two three games maybe not having him I I'm a little worried Jamin going forward these next few games I I think that you know the the game against Toronto FC next weekend is going to be a barometer for for where the team's at and what they might look like going forward this season, because with, you know, a rotating list of guys on that injury list with a rotating list of guys who are going to be out for, for national team duty, uh, the Quakes could for the next five, six weeks consistently be down a few players in the midfield and at home against Toronto, I think is going to be a litmus test for where they're at this game. It makes me worried about that Toronto game, but I don't think this game is indicative of where the San Jose Earthquakes are at right now. They're going and playing against, you know, an unbeaten St. Louis team in cold weather, have a couple injuries in the middle of the match, uh, get unlucky in a lot of different ways. I don't think this is the barometer of where they're at right now. But next week, I think that's going to be really telling about, you know, where the Earthquakes are going to be headed this season uh, and, and whether they're a team that's going to be stuck fighting for that, you know, bottom two playoff teams or whether they have the capacity to be more than that this year. John Jay, I have a good question here. Is everyone else's third cam and third DM better than no. So, you know, this is the problem with the salary cap league structure in which the teams are incented to be basically spending only at a few positions. Uh, no, this league in general is not set up with enough depth to do what they're attempting to do with leagues cup. I do think it's a significant problem I think they have are going to probably have significant issues against League MX and League's Cup. It's going to show the issues with depth in the league, is my opinion. And uh, hopefully they will realize that if they want to be able to compete consistently and win CONCACAF Champions League, they want to be able to win in League's Cup without a home field advantage, which they get in every single game. It's the only way MLS would be is competitive with League MX in terms of depth you know, that they do need to uh, to do that. So no, the answer is everyone else's third cam and third DM is not better than ours. 
Um, Jamin, I, know, I want to. By, ask by the way, about... people make personal comments about hosts. You're going to get run. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Jamin, I, I want to ask you about something that you brought up in the press conference, which was Christian Espinosa getting double teamed on that right wing. Tonight might be the first time that that's happened this season. You know, he's contributed to a goal in every single game he's played so far this year, three for three. Uh, tonight he didn't, and that's because St. Louis put him under a ton of pressure on that right side. Uh, double teamed him every time mm-hmm. uh, that he got the ball. It felt like they were the first team to actually plan uh, to play Christian Espinosa on that right side. Uh, that felt effective. Is there anything the Quakes can do about that now that teams are are cognizant of that? Well, so this is what uh, so Colin and I have both written about this, but in, from various angles. So, so if you haven't checked out Colin at Nyer's latest article, because I do always like to remind people that these these things are out there. Um, you know, check it out because Colin talked, you know, well before this game, but even he wrote this even before the Miro, you know, red card situation, how the quakes were short in central midfield, their biggest issue, in my opinion, in the attack has been the, the, their ability to create out of the central midfield, whether it's Miro, who was, you know, 20th out of 26 attacking midfielders last week, last year in expected uh, goals and expected assists, Um, whether it's, you know, Jackson trying, you know, to to become a final third merchant, which has not ever been, I think he's capable, but it's just not what he's done in his career, thereby he hasn't really developed it as much as maybe he would have had he always been asked to play, you know, this high up the pitch earlier in his career. So I don't hold that against him. I just don't, you know, the guy that you have that can do that is Nico Chakiris. And he needs playing time. And first, to get playing time, he needs to get healthy. So he's, you know, he's he's had a bit of a groin injury, and it's not very clear when he's going to get it back. So the only attack that this team has uh, really right now that is fairly consistent is through the wings. And if you take Espinoza out, the only place that you have is the other wing, right? And I was asked, you know, my opinion of Cade, you know, versus Benji. And I've always been a little bit more of a Benji guy because while Cade has higher upside over the long term, you know, Benji is more ready right now. And if you're trying to win games this year and you're trying to make the playoffs this year, yes, I know you need to feature Cade and you need to, you know, uh, potentially sell him to Europe. I just think overall, Benji gives you more on the defensive side and he gives you more variety in the attack. I'm not saying he's a better necessarily always attacker than Kate. I just think he gives you more variety, but I've been Benji, saying this for a long Benji time. got an opportunity tonight and he did not cover himself in glory. He had one but chance to be with and, and, and he Kate, wasn't Kate able to, to get anything else on it. And, and Kate didn't get on the end of it at all. So look, neither one of them covered themselves in glory tonight. Look, and Benji was in front of a, a friendly crowd in St. Louis too. So I, I, here's the thing. I actually think that Cade Cowell has improved in one important aspect this season, and that I think this season he's able to get into goal scoring positions more consistently. And his movement off the ball has been a lot better. Has he been able to finish those chances? No. But I think that he has set his teammates up for success. And I think if he keeps doing that, it's only a matter of time before he starts scoring. So, Last season, I was 100% on the same wavelength as you. Last season, Benji Kikanovich was your guy. He was the one who was in form. Yeah, he was the one but, who's more game ready. K. Cowell was not. This season, but, but he's not starting. I don't know if he's that's not true getting, anymore, Jamin. He's Benji not getting Kikanovich enough time. looks like his confidence is shot right now. He has come in off the bench multiple games, and he has failed to make a dent whatsoever. But he's got to actually get a chance to start. It's not like Cade has done something to definitively earn the starting spot. We have not seen that from Cade. Not yet. He might bring it, but he hasn't yet. So until he does, I would just look at making a change for two or three games and seeing if you can get more out of that left side. Because if they're going to take Christian Espinosa away from you, you know, you're going to need to have an alternative. And right now, the alternative needs to be on that left side, and you're not getting it. You can say that that Benji's not bringing it either, and I'll agree with you, because he's definitely not showing what he showed last season. But he's not starting. Kate is. And Kate, so Kate is the one that has to prove something right now, less so Benji. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give Benji a run. I think if you start Benji on the left wing against Toronto FC, that's a good decision. You see where he's at, uh, and you see if he's uh, ready to take that starting spot back from Cade Cowell. I think that's 
a, a solid decision. Is there anything else that Luchi Gonzalez can do to set this team up for success against Toronto FC, or is it just a matter of praying and, and hoping at this point? Well, so keep in mind that they've already seen Toronto FC in preseason. You know, Toronto defensively is struggle. Yes, they have an attack. They have a very potent attack. We all know, you know, the players that are that are on that line. But defensively, they have been really bad. One of the worst teams in the league. So you, you're going to have an opportunity and you're going to get it at home at least, um, you know, to be able to get behind that line. So this is this is the opportunity that that you know, the Quakes are going to have, they may not be, they may not be very healthy in the back, but they're not hurt in the front. You know, you've, you've got your starting, you're going to have your starting five, your top five, you're going to have Jamiro, you're going to have Yule, you're going to have Espinoza, you're going to have uh, uh, Cade or Benji, you got your pick, either one, and you're going to have j So look, your attack is in fine shape, your defense is in shambles, but so is theirs. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to have to probably end up putting two or three in the back of the net to have a chance to walk out with a win at home. The thing I'm most worried about, besides the midfield, the midfield is... Tyler you know, knows. Tyler's from, Tyler, our St. Louis fan, who's joined us tonight. By the way, thank you, Tyler. I, I, actually, I love it when opposing fans join the show, so long as they're respectful, and you've been very respectful, so thank you. Yeah, he says uh, he thinks that we should win 4-2 against Toronto. There you go. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Take a high-scoring game. Not only because the midfield, the other thing I was going to mention is Tanner Beeson in that back line. If Rodriguez uh, stays out, it, it was a little unclear what his injury was. Were you able to catch that, Jamin? What, what exactly no. he went down with other than a vague muscle No, No, any, anytime you get these like cold, you know, potentially cold-related injuries, it's really tough to say like what actually happened. My son had, this, had something happen to him the other night. You know, uh, he's a defensive midfielder. And just, you know, like tweaked his back and, you know, these things just happen and you can't tell like what happened, but, uh, but, you know, stuff like that can happen in these, in these kind of like cold and rain type situations. And tonight a little bit of even snow. And so if Rodriguez remains out, I'm worried about Tanner Beeson because Tanner Beeson might be the most reactive defender that I've ever seen. He doesn't step to his man. He doesn't get in the right spaces to block the ball he stays two feet back from his man and tries to make every single block as if he were a goalkeeper. He had in the, in the, the sequence for, for St. Louis's third goal, he had two consecutive blocks and then the third one was deflected and put into the back of the net. I would love to see a Tanner Beeson uh, shot blocking compilation from the course of his career. Cause it's one thing he does well, but it's not a sort of sustainable way of defending uh, because you're, you know, hemorrhaging shots on goal, and you're going to have shots like that uh, deflect into the back of the net and put the goalkeeper in a tough situation. Uh, what were your thoughts on Tanner Beeson's performance tonight? Is he a spot of concern, or, or you think he's uh, he's he's ready to step back into the starting lineup? I, I I think whenever you sub on the back line, you're asking for trouble. So you know, Tanner Beeson, if he's starting, I expect more from him than if he's coming in in a 20 degree game in St. Louis. You know, if he's if he's starting against uh, Toronto, I would expect bigger, you know, a better performance from him than, than necessarily what you're going to see in a, in a game like tonight. Um, John Jay, I think with a really good comment here, JT had a JT game. There was a great save, fantastic save, you know, early in the game, uh, ball bending to the far post, JT at full stretch. It's the kind of save that he makes, but he, he didn't make the save that he generally doesn't make. And, you know, so from that perspective, I completely agree with John Jay. Uh, JT had a JT game. It's it's fine in most situations. You know, if you're get, putting a couple in the back of the net, you might be okay. But uh, but you know, not tonight and 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 not three. There's a common uh, from last one was, Jorge, was a, the last one was of course deflected. There, I don't blame any keeper on a deflection. There's there's a comment here from from Jorge about uh, is it Emmy time. The answer is, unfortunately, no. Emi Ochoa hasn't even been making uh, the 18-man, the 20-man rosters. Uh, even though Danielle uh, was injured last weekend uh, and you know, had a, wasn't able to kick the ball, which is a little imperative if you're a soccer player, uh, he, Emi Ochoa did not make that roster. They still put Danielle over him in the lineup. So, so I expect that JT will be able to, to stick this out 
uh, and uh, Emmy Ochoa, I guess now is the is on the roster. He was on the roster tonight, Jamin. Is that correct? Yeah, Emmy Ochoa. In fact, I there uh, was a comment. Uh, someone said that they believe it was his first. I I would need to confirm that with uh, Quake's PR. Um, but they believe it was the first time that he's made a uh, made a twenty man roster for an MLS uh, game. So if that's true. Congratulations to Emmy. Obviously, you know, it, it, due, due to Daniel's injury. But, um, you know, do I think like the Quakes are closer to starting Emmy? No, I don't think so. Um, however, given the situation, I don't know if that's why he was not called into the, uh, the US uh, U20 roster this time around. But it wouldn't surprise me if the Quakes said no, given the keeper injury situation. They need to have a second keeper. And I expect Quakes too. We'll probably start the season with Eric De La Serta or somebody else in goal. Come on, Jamin. I'd love to see, uh, you know, who, who, who do you think would be the first outfield player to step in goal? I'd, I'd love to see Jack Skane throw on the gloves. I'd love to oh, see. Oh, Tommy, if he's Mensa on the field, is totally stepping in goal. Tommy, you think Tommy, Tommy, well, he plays every position anyway. So he <laughs> very clearly could play goalkeeper. I know? think, I, I think actually, it has to I be actually think Tommy, I think it's Tanner. I think Tommy, I think Tommy Thompson and like, you know, I don't know, one of those kind of like pick up like, you know, World Cup type games. He's the kind of kid who would just like throw on the gloves and be like, OK, I'll play keeper. And he'll just like be in there and play keeper all the time. But I he would think, never play keeper in a real game and, unless forced to. It's it's the probably the last position uh, that he has yet to play in Major League Soccer is is goalkeeper. So yeah. uh, the fans want it. to make it happen. Yeah. Tommy wants to be the keeper. Michael Michael Peachy agrees. Michael, Michael Peachy is, is the height. expert on all things Tommy Thompson. So whatever he says, I agree with. Tommy By the way, Michael, we're, we're glad you're alive. We're glad you made it out. And I, if you didn't catch it, I got the aftershock scarf up there just for you tonight. So, by the way, and Michael is a uh, Michael is a keeper. Uh, Michael Peachy is a, is a keeper, so he knows a little bit about being a keeper. So there you go. I, right. we're, having, we're having a little here. fun tonight. We try to do this sometimes when well, it's just the two of us, and also. Uh, you know, after a tough loss, we'd like to try to keep it a little bit lighter. Yeah, Jamin, there was a question back here that I want to bring back, which is, who is our true leader? Oh, you, I'm sorry. You're trying to actually throw up a we're question. Fighting. We're fighting. We're fighting. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to click things here. Yeah. Um, who is our true leader? We need to make Mensa our captain. His leadership level and experience has earned him the arm man, even if he's new. Jackson's not a fighter and a leader. This is an interesting comment because tonight, Jamin, we heard in the uh, post-match press conference from Luchi Gonzalez – our colleague Fabian Reco asked Luchi Gonzalez, who's the vocal leader standing up in that locker room, you know, leading this group of guys, telling them to pick their heads up. He did not say Jackson Ewell, the club captain. He said JT Marcinkowski and Jonathan Mensa. Jackson Ewell isn't that vocal leader. As much as we want him to be that leader, as much as the Quakes want him to step into that role, given how long he's been with the club, given the fact that he's a, you know, a homegrown guy, he's not been doing that. Is it time to make Jonathan Mensa captain? Um, look, uh, my understanding, I, and I could be wrong about this. My understanding is that the players pick the captain. It's not like it's not like it's oh, it's the guy with the most experience in the team, or it's you know whomever the coach picks, or whatever the case is. To my understanding, the Quakes players pick the captain, and if they are picking uh, Jackson, then I think there's probably leadership qualities that we don't get to observe as much. Although I did see a bit of it in the Quakes Axis, by the way. You, you know, you did get to see kind of some of the uh, pregame talk and everything that Jackson does. He does seem vocal in the huddles uh, and such. But it does not surprise me that in a postgame situation after a loss like that, the person you're going to hear from is, you know, the, 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 the MLS veteran in the locker room, Jonathan Mensa, or even, you know, uh, J JT Marcinkowski, given – you know, how much of the game was kind of played in front of him tonight. Uh, he, he had a good view of it for sure. And, uh, you know, he certainly could could call things out if he doesn't think that people put in the effort to, on the defensive side tonight. But, you know, I, I like Jonathan Mensa as potentially the next guy up uh, in terms of the captainship. It, it, he's very new to the team. Uh, and so for that reason, I can kind of see why not. Um, you know, Montero's a bit kind of hot headed for me. I don't know that it's something that um, it's, I don't know that it's something that Jibo wants, but I think he's just kind of like this calm, like, you know, evenly spoken, you know, cerebral guy. 
and maybe that's just not the, the guy you want in the locker room to be the captain. But, um, you know, the, outside of outside of that, you know, they it's I don't know that they've got the right person, you know, outside of Mensa to to really be the next person up here. So, like, there are, there are lots of dynamics, Jamin, that we're not privy to. Here might be an that's right. argument that's right. to make Jonathan Mensa captain. I think that Jonathan Mensa would bring a level of accountability and an expectation set of expectations that the Quakes might not have had over the last few years. Jackson Ulo's captain is business as usual. It's a continuation of the the last five or six years of club culture, which has not been good enough. I think bringing a leader from a successful MLS team who has a proven track record of success and implanting him in this team is going to you know, inject uh, this new set of expectations and this new culture. And it's going to, you know, I think, help the earthquakes transition into the Luchi Gonzalez era. Do you, do you think that argument holds weight at all? Um, you know, again, I, we're just not privy to the information and, and to be quite honest, like the captain arm man, isn't necessarily the person who's the best at yelling at the referee on the field. That's not what it's intended to be. I know that's what we see. Um, and, and, you know, to someone's point, uh, someone made it, made the comment here, you know, uh, if, if that's what you're looking for, then, uh, you know, Jackson was, you know, was right there. And look, the yellow cards were one-sided tonight. Um, I think the fouls were called fairly evenly. The yellow cards only went one direction pretty much. Um, and Jackson was letting the referees know. Uh, I'm not someone who complains about officials. Everyone knows, I think, if you're complaining about officials, it's a loser mentality. Uh, and uh, so I don't like coming on here unless there's something really egregious to talk about uh, when it comes to officials. But, you know, Jackson, you know, you're looking for Jackson to remind the official about the other situations like you gave us a yellow for kicking the ball away and then that guy kicks the ball away and he gets nothing, you know, you know, yes, absolutely. I expect Jackson Yule to be there. And he was, uh, besides that, we don't know what goes on in the locker room. Jamin, this is an interesting comment from Christian Acosta here. He says hindsight is 2020, but a game like this, I would have been okay with Remedy as a bench six. Did the quakes hold on to the wrong guy? Should they have kept Remedy and let Judson go? Would that have well, been it- possible? I think the difficult thing is you, you and I saw that Judson was on the side when we went to, to, to the last preseason game there, Alex. I, you know, in hindsight, would right, right now, would the Quakes take Eric Remitty? Uh, yeah, so long as he's not a locker room problem, I, don't, I had no indication that he was. You know, certainly I think it would be good for depth right now to have, an, uh, have Eric Remitty. Um, I would even honestly take Jan Gregush, uh, as overpaid as he was. But, uh, you know, you, the Quakes could use a bit of that uh, depth right now. They don't have it. And we're starting to find out that that's a bit of a problem, right? So, again, calling on point, saying that the Quakes need to make another investment into central midfield. Right now, there's, you know, there's a real question mark around the six. You know, uh, you might need Jackson Yule to kind of drop back into the six where he's, he played a little bit. But that means you got to get something else on the attacking side. You got to feel pretty good about what you're getting on the attacking side if you're going to ask him to drop back, as he's done before. Jamie, these conversations aren't as fun as the conversations we've been having the the last few weeks. It feels like this is a low point. Do you, do you think it this gets a, better or worse from here? Well, you know, again, I think every every away game we go through some version of this because let's be honest, the Quakes only won one away game last year, and as Tommy said tonight, winning on the road in MLS is tough. He's right, but you got to win more than one. Um, the Quakes have won two at home. They've lost two on the road. If you say like, you know, how do you feel four games into the season with six points? I would say as a Quakes fan, you should feel pretty good compared to where things have been in previous seasons. Uh, so long as you're winning at home, you can take losses on the road, but, and, and you, and you probably, you know, would rather pay for a winning team than a losing team when it comes to paying for your ticket. That said, and I've, I've said this is a mid-table team, it's always easy to feel after a game like tonight, like things are trending in the wrong direction because the last game, things have. Um, I think Toronto is going to be a decent test um, of the depth of this team. Toronto's depth will also be tested. Uh, both teams, you know, that's going to be a good five games. I've, I've said five games is a good benchmark. Ten games is a good benchmark. That'll be game five. Ask me again after game five and I'll have a pretty good answer for you. I think that's a, a, a good 
uh, shift a good segue towards our final comments here, Jamin. I know we're approaching the hour mark. Before we do that, I want to plug the Quakes Epicenter Patreon uh, because for $2 a month, you can help contribute to make all of this happen. You can get early access to the articles written by our fantastic team on quakesepicenter.com. We had an article by the one and only Colin Etnier come out earlier this week about where the Quakes can add to this roster. I think a game like tonight, you saw why why that uh, th- those summer additions could be really important, where the next piece is in this team. So subscribe to the Patreon, $2 a month to get access to that article and all of the content on the website. For $5 a month, you also get to join uh, our Quakes Epicenter patron Slack. I think we now have over 100 fans on the Slack channel. You get to hear from some of the most brave and resilient and dedicated fans out there. We had Michael Peachy tonight in the Slack giving us live updates from St. Louis. He braved the cold. I think, I think Zach Holman the, was also there, I believe. Zach Holman as well. Into, I think he was. He was. Uh, he didn't send us pictures like Michael did of his Aftershock scarf, so I am disappointed in that if, if Zach is going to uh, watch this back later. But I think he was there, yeah. He said, something, he said something in the Slack that, uh, that made me think that he was there. If anyone knows for sure Zach was there, let me know. Making the trip. I think it speaks to the community that we have in the Slack, Jamin, uh, and, and what we've been able to build. So for $5 a month, you can uh, join the Patreon Slack. Michael has made it to the comments section here tonight uh, to join us. Uh, glad you made it, Michael. Hope you can feel your hands again. Uh, and uh, yeah, and you can also support uh, all of the work that goes on here on the Aftershock Slack post-game right. show. The Slack is where rumors are made. That's where they're first reported. Everything happens first <laughs> in the Slack, Jamin. Yes, um, you and I, you and I, both the rumor trackers that we are, uh, which is to say, no, we're not. But anyway, um, Jamin. But yes, Jamin, people, people definitely love to make rumors there. Let me put it that way. Uh, your your final thoughts from tonight, Jamin, as we as we move towards wrapping here. Yeah, th- you know, look, three zero is is a tough road loss. Uh, you would have liked to, if you're going going to lose, you'd probably like to see it by a bit of better scoreline. Also, would feel better if there was a goal in the back of the net. You know, if it's a three one game, if it's a two one game, you know, you could probably swallow it a little bit better at this point. Um, but you know, it's it's going to take. I think it's going to take some patience right now to see through some of these injuries, international call-ups. Just remember, you know, the other teams that the Quakes are playing are going, going to be going through some of the same thing, at least on the international call-up side and some of them on the injury side as well. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, the Toronto game, I think, is the litmus test. That's an important one. And, uh, you know, I would read not as much into tonight as probably we would on a reaction post-game show. Um you know, because this is about the post-game reactions. But uh, honestly, there's a point tonight at which it was kind of like, you know, let's just get to the, not, you know, let's just get to the end of the game and see if we can get everyone off the field as healthy as possible. So, you know, that's that's where uh, I was. Uh, that, that's kind of where I'm at tonight, Alex. It's a little bit of a downer tonight. Uh, we try to keep it a little bit lighter where we could. But, uh, you know, it, it's tough after a game like tonight to kind of know, like, what's going to happen next with this team. It's taken every ounce of will and reserve that I have not to torch in to Tommy Thompson, not to torch in uh, to, to Baldissimo and, and some of the guys who were the culprits for some of those goals in the midfield there, Jamin. And I tried to withhold some of my frustration and anger because I know that this game, this result is not indicative of where the Quakes are at right now at, at this point in the season. Uh the fact that they've suffered so many injuries and, and the fact that their, their depth chart looks like this makes me worried. This result makes me a little plants a few seeds of doubt, but the game that's going to be the litmus test is the Toronto game. That's going to be, I think a much stronger indication of, of where the earthquakes are at at this point uh, in the season. So that's why I'm, I'm withholding uh, some of my, some of my judgment for that game. If, if it's another bad game, You'll have to join us after that one for the post-match uh, aftershock show. Uh, but I think tonight it's too early, especially in a game against you know the top team in the league right now, who looked really strong, and I could see uh, you know continuing to to, to tear through the league uh, for the rest of the year with the the intensity uh, and the quality uh, that they had 
uh, that was an incredible performance from St. Louis. Don't want to take that away from them. And even with all of that said, if Cade Cowell can put one or two balls in the back of the net, we could have been talking about a, a different game. So that's why I'm that's why I'm withholding, reserving some of my judgment for next week, Jamin. It's been a pleasure, Jamin. I, I want to thank everyone for, for joining us uh, on the show tonight for bearing through uh, that game with us. Uh, and uh, we will see you all next weekend. Yeah, be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.